This is the story of an absolutely terrifying time in Chicago. A capsule of Tylenol was laced with cyanide. In 1982, people were dying. We don't know the extent of the contaminations. After someone placed bottles of poison Tylenol on the shelves of different stores in different Chicagoland communities. The Food and Drug Administration is now urging consumers nationwide to stop taking Tylenol products. It was one of the most intensive manhunts in Chicago history. We have over 100 agents if you combine the state, and federal, and local agents on the street. And to this day, the crimes remain unsolved. I'm hopeful that someday someone, name not mentioned here, will be brought to justice for this series of horrible murders. WMAQ-TV, Chicago, live on Channel 5. This is the 430 News with Ron Majors and Linda Yu. Good afternoon. At least three people are dead tonight. Another is in very critical condition after taking the over-the-counter drug extra-strength Tylenol capsules. Those capsules were apparently laced with cyanide. The news came suddenly and events were happening fast. Authorities weren't even really sure what was happening, but they knew they needed to act quickly. I think the, the only safe course here is that uh, uh, people should refrain from taking extra strength Tylenol. You felt there was an urgent need to get out in front of, of the public. There was, and that was because there was cyanide uh, in Tylenol and the public had to be warned about that so that they wouldn't take it any, any further because once you took the pill, you were gonna die. At that point, authorities didn't even know how many victims they had or if there might be more. 12-year-old Mary Kellerman had died in Elk Grove Village, Adam Janis in Arlington Heights. His brother and sister-in-law, overcome with grief, had returned to the family home. They were feeling bad and they said, do you have any pain reliever? They went into the bathroom and they, they took uh, tablets or capsules from that same container and very soon they were stricken. Authorities had caught one break. Paramedics in neighboring suburbs noted the similarities in the deaths. And I said, it's, it's funny, I said, the only connection that we can find so far is that uh, everybody has taken Tylenol. There were two more victims, Mary McFarland in Elmhurst and Mary Reiner in West Suburban Winfield. Winfield, Illinois, where this latest poisoning case has been reported, is located about 25 miles from the northwest Chicago suburbs where the initial deaths occurred, meaning that the tainted drugs have had some degree of circulation. Six people dead in communities across Chicagoland, and everything you just saw was from the first 24 hours. The next two days would bring two big developments. First, the race to find every bottle of Tylenol and to get them off the shelves. We do a, uh, a wait of all 50 of them. The FDA, its investigators and chemists are working on an emergency basis today. Investigators trying to track down 93,400 bottles of super strength Tylenol capsules with a serial number MC2880. We want to get all these capsules off the street and secured. Police and city inspectors continued bringing in their catch of Tylenol products today, removed from store shelves and city residents' medicine cabinets. In the Daly Center basement laboratories, health department technicians had, by early evening, already analyzed 200 bottles, 33,000 tablets, and 46,000 capsules. We know we have a problem. Nobody knows the cause of the problem. The word went out to the entire nation, don't take Tylenol. But here in Chicago, there was another death. The latest victim, United Airlines flight attendant Paula Prince, lived in a near Northside high rise. Her body was found by her sister and a friend Friday night. An open bottle of extra strength Tylenol lay nearby on the bathroom sink. She reportedly purchased it at the Walgreens drugstore at North and Wells. Paula Prince was victim number seven and had likely died on the very first day. 
All police knew for certain was that the killer was still out there and he might not be done. Those of us uh, involved in this were absolutely consumed by uh, a relentless sense of mission to figure out who did this, how do we stop them, and how do we then bring justice to them. <laughs> In 1982, Jeremy Margolis was an assistant U.S. attorney. He worked on the Tylenol case from day one. Every conceivable theory, every conceivable motive, uh, virtually every possibility that one's imagination could conjure up was looked at. We were thinking constantly, what could it be? What have we missed? What stone have we not uh, turned over? And how was it done? Were the capsules tampered with at the factory or in the distribution chain? Or did the killer simply travel from store to store, putting the tainted bottles on the shelf? The only thing that makes sense, since we haven't found any uh, particular location with more than one bottle at this point in time, our testing procedures will confirm that. Since Thursday, radio, television, and newspapers have been saturated with warnings about Tylenol. But some people, people who don't speak any English, haven't been getting the message. Many ethnic groups have enlisted the help of churches, which are announcing the warning at services. The Chinese-American community posted signs in stores, and representatives went through the streets in police squad cars, announcing the danger in three dialects. Extra strength Tylenol, cyanide. Tonight, WEGC radio was broadcasting advisories in Ukrainian, hoping that their countrymen who do not speak English would hear the warning. It must have felt like a race against time. Of course. A scary one. It was palpable. Uh, it impacted everybody's life in a really fundamentally frightening way. Good evening. For the first time since seven persons died of cyanide poisoning in the Tylenol case, police have a suspect in custody. 48-year-old Roger Arnold is being held here in Chicago tonight on weapons charges. When police searched his house on the near south side yesterday, they found guns, ammunition, and curiously, chemistry books, army field manuals, and even a book that explains in detail how to make potassium cyanide and put it into capsules in order to kill people. Arnold looked at first like a troubling suspect. He worked at a grocery distribution center. He actually knew the father of one of the victims. He would be in the public eye for days, but was eventually ruled out. That's devastating. That's, that is a, a brand or a stigma that's put on uh, an individual that's going to last forever. That, of course, is absolutely right. But the public eye would soon shift to someone else. A story in today's edition of the Chicago Sun-Times says the FBI is investigating a Chicago man who allegedly sent a letter to the manufacturers of Tylenol with an implied threat to repeat the cyanide murders if a $1 million ransom is not paid. We have a nationwide search for a picture of a person who identifies himself as, at one time as James E. Lewis and Robert Richardson. The extortion letter had demanded that a million dollars be deposited to a Chicago executive's bank account. That executive was quickly ruled out, but he identified Lewis as someone who might have a grudge against him. Then, Lewis wrote another letter. In the letter published in the Tribune today, Lewis implies that the extortion was an attempt to embarrass his wife's former Chicago employer and denies any involvement in the Tylenol murders. There was more. This security photo, which showed victim Paula Prince buying her poison Tylenol, and what appeared to be a bearded man watching nearby, who bore a resemblance to James Lewis. Nationwide manhunt for Lewis and his wife was on. Our prime suspects at this point in time by anyone's definition of what a suspect is. James Lewis was arrested on December 13th in a library reading room in Manhattan. He has been held on a $5 million bond in New York City 
on a warrant charging him with trying to extort $1 million from the manufacturer of Tylenol. In the end, that was the only charge that Lewis would ever face, although he was never shy about his thoughts on the case. Lewis spent many hours sitting with us, uh, speculating uh, in word and in manuscript and uh, in art form uh, how the Tylenol killer might have committed the crimes. He even drew this sketch from Margolis speculating about how the killer may have gotten the cyanide into the capsules. The question for prosecutors, was Lewis just an extortionist or was he the Tylenol killer? We uh, moved heaven and earth to determine which of those two possibilities it was. And what was your determination? I've, I've uh, never publicly described what my view was. All I can say is, as of now, now, no one has been prosecuted for the Tylenol killing. In 2009, authorities raided Lewis's Massachusetts home, carting away boxes of evidence and a computer. The following year, he and his wife were required to give DNA samples, but there was no visible movement in the case. Lewis did not respond to our request for an interview, but back when he was in prison for the extortion case, he always denied involvement in the actual killings. They're barking up the wrong tree, and as long as they continue to do this, it absolutely guarantees that they will never solve the Tylenol homicides. Again, Lewis was only charged with the extortion of Johnson & Johnson. So, where are we now? Well, first, it's important that you know that there is a current Tylenol investigation. My name is Joe Murphy. I'm a detective with the Arlington Heights Police Department. This is an active investigation. It's an active homicide investigation that involves many uh, municipalities and, and other government agencies. We still receive tips that are being evaluated and investigated. Um, we also are still, we're, we're looking at emerging uh, forensic technology. You've kept everything? Yes. Yes, we still have all the evidence. Pills, bottles, boxes? Correct. So there's contaminated pills, um, untainted pills, bottles, boxes like you mentioned, the cotton balls inside. Following hundreds of officers who worked this case in decades past, Murphy says he hopes new technology, especially new advances in DNA, might lead to a breakthrough, or that someone who wants to clear their conscience might come forward. There's always a chance that somebody's told somebody something, and for the past 38 years they've been afraid to come forward, but now we're 40 years later, approaching 40 years later, now might be the time. That would mean a potential solution to one of Chicago's most enduring mysteries, which began with a very public, very frightening warning. When they asked me, you know, you realize you, you've got the people out there panicked, and I said, well, in this case, panic is probably an appropriate response so, so that they realize that if they take this medicine, uh, they're, they're gonna die. An important message from the makers of Tylenol. You are all aware of recent tragic events. Tylenol itself would bounce back in a big way. After seeing its star product pulled from the shelves in the aftermath of the murders, parent company Johnson & Johnson reacted quickly, reintroducing Tylenol two months later in triple sealed containers and quickly regaining market share as the number one over-the-counter pain reliever in the United States. We value that trust too much to let any individual tamper with it. We want you to continue to trust Tylenol. But the murders themselves remain a mystery. Even today, those who were a part of Chicagoland's biggest investigation say a solution is important for one very simple reason. You believe there is still information that could make this a solvable case? Yes, and some peace and some comfort after all these decades will be brought to the families of those victims. I truly do believe it's possible, and I really do hope for that day.